great. I was going to ask if you were going to record it because I'm, I'm yeah, was worried that would be taking notes too fast. All right. The recording started. Well, hello. This is Mike Pucciarelli. And tonight I'll be talking about how to use the white plex table with continuous light. So I will not be talking about flash. I'll be talking about some continuous lights. You can buy it that contain multiple bulbs. First, I'm going to give an introduction to who I am. Um, I started digital photography around 2010. In 2013, I graduated from Montgomery College. In 2015, I joined PPA, Professional Photographers of America. And then got my craftsman in 2021. And then that's when I joined American Society of Photographers. And then from 2017 and later, I started joining some local affiliate clubs. So my latest achievement was a CVP, Certified Professional Photographer. That's a rigorous exam with image evaluation, and it's a good achievement. But tonight, we'll be talking about the white flex table. I mean, how to you know how to use you know a light with using a modifier in place of a light. So when you use one light, you can use a modifier, for, you know, bringing detail in the shadow. And then I'll talk about illustration and equipment, stuff you can buy at a store, stuff you can make. And tonight, the camera settings, the cameras that I'll be using is the camera R5 and R6. And those cameras are very similar, but there are some differences. Yeah? But the menus systems are the same. And then I have a demo in Bridge and Photoshop. And then I have a screenshot demo in Adobe Camera Raw or Bridge and Photoshop explain things even more. So if you have any questions, you can always email me and I'll check the chat. You can also just, you know, interrupt me and I'll try to answer the question. I'm gonna first quickly do my portfolio. So we're talking about this image, how I use continuous light and I use some black cards to take away some glares to make it look better. So you're bringing out the product label better. And this is all with that white plexiglass table. And I had two lights at um, Photovic and a Spider 5. And this is with the same technique, you know, Spider 5 and also Phototech, but I also had to um, turn one of the switches off so I could bring detail in the shadow. These are my other images I did. A light painting, like the light paint motorcycles, like the light paint my own car, motorcycle. I like the light paint stall, still life. I like experiment with black and white. So we're talking about this table, a white plex table. And this table comes with a frame. And then I got this from Amazon many years ago. It's still the same table I use today. And it's different from the white plex table, the black, and other tables. So we're talking about we could we're gonna talk about lighting modifiers with any table, and that includes um, a white plex table. And a modifier will modify the light, it can get the effect that you like. And if you use mirrors, uh, silver card, gold cards, you can put good detail in the shadow. It's like adding light without using another electronic light. And the same with, you know, silver reflectors. And then your white reflectors, white cards, if you want to bounce on light in a soft way. 
And the other ways you could use white reflectors, if you shine a big light to the reflector, that can produce a good background. A lot of diagrams of that tonight. Then you have black cards. Black cards are great for if you have a glare, you could block, you know, that part of the, the glare to help you get the effect you like. So on that Coke bottle, I had to use a black card to take out that harsh glare. Then there's fusion scrims. And fusion scrims are great for softening the light, but also for creating a cool background. Now the colorful gels, gels are great for changing the color of the subject in the backgrounds. And then there's medium-sized white flex sheets where if you want to put that in front of a light, that can soften the light. Then there's cinephil. Cinephil is like black, tough aluminum foil where you can create a snoot if you don't have money to buy a regular snoot. And you have blinds. It's great for angling the natural light. But with continuous light, I recommend that you get as much natural light as you can to make the photograph look natural. Well, bottom tools are great. You know, spring clamps, CUG clamps, any size is great. It's great for holding thing above for a background or to help you take a photograph. And they use duct tape and clothespins, you know, they attach like color gels or the plastic fusion material on the soft box of the strobe. And a lot of this you can buy at a hardware store, or department store. You can buy all this online. This is the white plexiglass table, and you can use it with one or more lights. You can use it with natural light, and I recommend that with continuous light. You can also use it with LED lights. And two things are really important with the white flex table. It's angle the camera, uh, position of the light. Because when you angle the camera a certain way, you can get a certain type of photograph. Like if I bring out the inflections, you want to use a certain angle of the camera. And the same thing with the light. You want to get a completely white background, you position the light in a certain way, like right underneath the subject. Like I'll talk about this later, you have a light shining right up. So I'll talk about how to use, you know, one or more lights with the white flex table. So this is one light with the white flex table. We could put a light here, we could put a light here. You can angle a light at a 40 degree angle or here. And you have wider silver cards, depending on what you want to do with the shadows. That will put in detail in the shadow, and it's a way to add lights. I like to use, you know, the Spider Westcott, deck, you know, D5s for, you know, solo product <laughs> photography. Now, there's other, you know, soft boxes you could use, like the Photovic. And I'll talk about those soft boxes in coming slides. And for anything shiny, I recommend putting like a fusion scrim so the glare won't be so harsh. You can also feather the light so that you can get nice smooth lighting effects. This is a diagram with one light. We have a light, these are all light positions. And I have a light here that I would have silver cards over here. And the subject of course be over here. Where I have a light over here, then I have several white cards just to bring in detail in the shadow. So, and this is what the standard curve plexiglass table. This is another way to use, you know, the light where you have a big D5 with the big soft box or another type of powerful soft, continuous soft box. And this scrim will make the background white. And this is glass, the light will shine right through. There's another way to use, you know, one light only with the white flex tip. The diagram, we have the tail here, we have the subject, we have the camera. 
you have one powerful continuous light or strobe. You have a nice big white screen reflector. So you get a nice, you know, white background. And this could be like a plexiglass sheet on like a stool or a cube that helped form a small new table. And you have white silver cards that bounce in light, depending on the effect that you like. Now we have two lights with a big curved table. We can have lights aiming at a 40 foot angle. You can have a light, light one, light two. We could have light one, light two. You can just have lights aiming at each other. And you can use many kinds of soft boxes. They come in different sizes. And this is great for bringing out the edges of the product photography. And you can use wider silver cards to bring in details of the shadow. In the diagram, we have, you know, one or light two or light one. They have a light over here. And since this is the big flex table, we can have a light underneath to bring out the reflections. You have another light. So there's many ways to use two lights with the big, you know, standard curved white plex table. And I recommend that you use a 40 degree angle when you do product photography. So you, you put detail on the edge, but you have also a shadow of it to make it look really natural. And again, you could use silver or white cards, you know, that bounce in light or put light to give shadow detail. This is another way to use two lights where this time we don't have a glass subject. We have a big soft box and we have a light aiming at, you know, a 40 50 angle or you can put a light here or here. But if you feel like here, then you want to put some detail in the shadow with the water silver card or the same thing. You have a light here. You can put silver, white silver cards here for the shadow. Many ways you use, you know, two lights with a small, you know, plex table. This is a small, you know, diagram for the small white plex table where we have the subjects here. We have the camera, a big light aiming through a white screen reflector. We could have a light here, or we could have a light here. We could also have a light on top. And we have silver cards on the side if we need just to put in details in the shadows. And then there's three lights where, and this is how I started doing, you know, plexiglass, you know, still life, where we have a nice curved table. We have a light that fires up. And the reason why I have it firing up like this, because I don't want reflection. But if I do, I would angle the light you know, aiming up at, you know, a 40 foot degree angle. You have like a strip box heavy here and you have light in the background. And, you know, soft box can come in many sizes and they have wider silver cards, you know, that put in detail in the shadow to make it look natural. That's why, you know, angle the light and also angle the camera can make a big, you know, difference when I'm um, getting the photograph you like. My diagram, we have a big three lights with the standard curve, you know, plexus table where we have your subject, you have light underneath, and it can be underneath the subject or it'd be aiming at a four degree angle to bring out the reflections. You have lights that are, you know, this would aim at a 40 degree angle, this one, you could have a backlight, you can have a side light. So there's many ways you can use, you know, three lights. And then you got good, you know, several white cards, you know, that put in detail in the shadow. And I recommend that using silver white cards because when you use too much light, it's obvious, or too much flash, it's obvious. It doesn't look as natural as if you were to, you know, replace it with the silver or white card.
And I use gels with continuous light. I know in flash, you can use all type, you can divide it in half, but like continuous light, I just prefer one color, like a light or a dark color and a one color. And you can attach the gels with, you know, clothes pins to the soft box material. And these are my spider, you know, D5s where their switches to turn these individual bobs off. And if there's, for instance, if you're using this and you want to put more detail on the shadow, like I did with that pair, I use a different light where I turned off a row of light and it looked more natural. And here's a soft box material to make the light softer. And you got the um, reflective, you know, aluminum material to illuminate the light. And I recommend using a scrim in front of the light to make it more softer. And in many ways you use, you know, spring clamps. You could make the table more flatter. You could also hold up boards with spring clamps. You can also do this with very big C or G clamps, but I like to use these three inch spring clamps. Yeah, and this is like a metal or metal, like a mirror reflector board with spring clamps attached to a big whiteboard. This is a big scrim where if you want to put a strobe, this is good for making the light smoother on the subject. So, I wonder if, I'm assuming there's no questions if you do. You can ask them. We could. So, are there any questions about this so far? Not so far. Okay. You can always email me. You can always put in a chat or just interrupt me. These are my other regular silhouette tables. This is for like for light painting, but that's a whole nother webinar. Now, we're going to talk about the camera settings for Canon R5 and R6. And when I do still light, I use manual. Light painting, I do bulb. But since you're talking about continuous light, I like to use manual. And I was shooting raw. And I have the plus S2. This is the JPEG that if I use the Wi Fi, I'll go right to the phone. In case you want to see my JPEG on a phone. And I always like to start maybe with F16. I always want to have ISO 100. So I'm going to control the ISO. I want to control the shutter and I want to control the aperture. And I like to start with 125th. I could, you know, reduce, cut the shutter from 125th to 250th to reduce the ambient light. But sometimes I could also adjust the aperture. Now I could increase the ISO depending on the light. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I might use 400, 800, but a lot of times I like to use 100 because I have enough light to do what I need to do. I'll talk about all these settings in upcoming slides. I always want to be in the single shooting mode, whether you do light painting, outdoor photography, I've used these other modes like the H plus continuous high speed, low speed. I use the timers. I use that, but I do a lot of, I always want to use a tripod and a cable release. So I always want to be take one shot at a time. But I've used all these shooting drive modes and they all work well. Pitch tab mode, these are all have good purposes. I always want to use S because it applies a little more sharpening. And it's a little more sharper than the portrait landscape. So I do all my work here. Now, then there's neutral. It's where there's no settings applied to the image. And these other F and FD, they have certain settings. Monochrome is when they affect the color of the pixels. I don't want to touch that. 
Then there's one, two, three, where if you're doing a lot of handheld stuff, sometimes it could just use certain settings on one, two, or three. The focus mode, I always want to use either this AF method or the vertical or horizontal. A lot of times, that's even here because you focus on several parts of the photograph, not just one. But I've used the others like the 1053, but I'd like to still use the zone autofocus. And I use the others, they all work well. And you got single point of focus to remove the cursor. Then the spot order for macro. Then tracking. I've used this for tracking, where you can also, when you have it over here, you could also enable the eye detection. You could change the animals. That works pretty good too. White balance. Um, I either use a daylight option or I just set the Kelvin at 5400 to 5600. Now, there's a setting I never use. It's auto white balance. Some people call this all wrong white balance or available wrong, but it's at least natural. And I'd rather just use either the daylight or just set the Kelvin. Now, I can time to time use white balance, custom white balance. And you set the white balance by shooting a white card. Then you, then you just use that. But if the light changes, you got to then you got to use another new custom white balance. That's why I rather just set the Kelvin and let it be at fifty six K. High speed ISO noise reduction. For probably exposed image, I would disable this. Maybe you could use low, but. Try to avoid using standard, maybe except for very high so, but now we have like advanced technologies like Topaz and Camera Raw that can take out the noise, but why not just disable this and just use a probably exposed image? But, you know, the setting is there if you need to use it, but I'd rather just not use it. Again, long exposure noise reduction. The early DSLRs, if you have long exposures, they have maybe blue streaks that would come, but technology advanced, so that's no longer a problem, but I'd rather disable it for a properly exposed image. Because suppose you're doing fireworks, you don't want to have it auto, you want to have this off. Because when you do like enable, it always goes through algorithms and it may take for a while to get back to the original screen. And that's why I'd just rather, you know, not to use this, but the probably exposed image. And you have the color space where I like to start with Adobe RGB, which is 57 billion colors or more. And then when you convert the sRGB, now down you're down to 16 million colors big color difference. And the two ways I use sRGB, if I'm posting on the web, I wanna check off the sRGB. If I copy a JPEG in Photoshop, I don't, because if you, if you check it off and copy in Adobe Photoshop, you may have a color mismatch problem. Then there's Profoto, which is 281 trillion colors, but keep in mind that the human eye can only recognize two or three million colors. And 281 trillion colors, so many colors are not recognized by our human eyes. And then the CMYK, which is 16,000 col 16, colors, big drop from sRGB, but this is good when you print. So I start from, I just use two, Adobe RGB and sRGB. Now the cropping aspect ratio, is you're using full frame, I want to use full because you use all the pixel power. If you use 1.6 or the others, you're not using all the pixel power, but they have good for other uses, but at the same time, you're not taking full advantage of all the pixel power. And that's why I just want to use full. 
Let's use a full frame. Auto exposure bracketing, where I do this a lot about the words. I don't do this too often in still life, even with continuous lighting, but I always start at the regular exposure and I just go one stop over to one stop under. I just want to do a stop because if you do two stops, the overexposed image will probably way overexpose and you'll have a hard time using some of those pixels. That's why when you're outside and you take a shot, you want to expose the highlights. You want to get one more stop over so that the overexposed image, you'll try to avoid those blinkies. So that means is you can work with all the pixels on all combined three HDR files. Then there's AF, you know, continuous. You know, when I bought my R6, um, it would always be focusing. So I just switched to the manual. But then I learned that if you disable it, you're in control of the focus. But if you enable it, you're not. So it's better to, you know, disable it. So when you press the thing, it focuses. Increments, I use thirds for everything, aperture, shutter. Now for the ISO, I just want to use the full stop, but I go to 100 to 200, 200 to 400, and I could go in. Now with the number of bracketed check shots, I always want to have a three, but with technology today, like this camera, the R5, R6, you can use many more than three. Now, the R5, R6, they both can use the XC and HC ending cards. There's a di big difference between the XC extended capacity and the secure, where the XC ending card is a lot faster and has a lot more storage than the HC ending card. Then there's a third card. It's great for video, but only R5 uses. But you can capture you know, 4K and full HD video. And of course, the, the bigger car, the more expensive, but you can do a lot of great things with the R5, but like maybe, I don't know, many gigabytes. And the more gigabytes, the longer video it can create. But just keep in mind, then the file's going to be huge. And it's great speed, but these cars all work well with these cameras, especially the Type B. And I just, when I use my R5, I put all my data on this card, but then I put all my, on the R6, I only put all my data on the XC ending card. And in many ways you could, you know, you could, you could record both images where if you delete it on one card it won't on the other, or you could just record separately, record the multiple. You can also auto switch card where if you run out of room on one card, I'll go to another card. A lot of people, what they do is they have it record play where they're looking at one card and if it's like a file, they delete it, but the backups on the other card. So if you take those lifetime vacations, you might want to think about recording on both, but you delete one. And we have Wi Fi with Droid. Or Six, the screens look familiar where you want to enable your Wi Fi settings or Bluetooth settings. You want to make sure your airplane is turned off. And that's a whole nother webinar. But this is great if you want to view your JPEGs on your iPad, or your iPhone, or Droid. And you use a Canon Connect software. And there are other ways to connect too. And that's a whole nother. I also have a video on that on my YouTube channel. I'll talk about it later. So when I connect, so it's just waiting connect. This is connect dive using the network, right? So then I got to start the Canon software and we just got to wait for connection and it says you're connected. 
The thing about this is you may have problems connecting, but if you wait a really long time, you may lose a connection. So make sure that the connection's on, but this is great. If you're outside and you don't have a computer, this will work great. But you wanna make sure that you use a Canon app software. And this is the R5 and R6. The R5 is twice as big as the R6. And I always want to use the biggest size where I still use a JPEG for the Wi-Fi. I don't touch a JPEG. I work with the raw file. And then I also convert it to like a DNG file. And GNG files, the more compact, it's the same thing, but they come up quicker when you open a folder in Windows Explorer. They're easy to work with. These are like D5, so you have five balls. We have a switch for every light bulb. And this is the aluminum, reflect, makes the light even more powerful. You have the softbox material. And this is the ball where the temperature is about 5,000 K. But the lumen on one bulb is like 17 lumens. Imagine having four bulbs that be four times 1,700 you know, lumens. And the bulbs are eco and they're great for making things softer. And the softbox material makes the light smooth. It comes with the three prong plug. You could also use this with any umbrella. It has like a hole for the umbrella. Sometimes you could, you know, have turn one, three, five and turn off two, four. You put some contrast in the shadows. This is a photo deck where we have a switch for this, a switch for this light row and a switch for, so the sweet switches, the switch for this. So this is great if you want to have turn one off and put a little detail in the shadow to make the light more dimensional. And you use the same eco bulbs. And you have a mirror for illuminating the light. You have the switches for the road, but this is a great light. If you want to use continuous, you want to put a little detail on the shadow. And it comes with three prong plug. You could also put an umbrella in the hole of the holder. There's another impact floodlight where you use the same bulbs, 1700 lumens, 5000K, and it could last like 10,000 hours. That's a long time. This is great. It's great for soft, continuous light. These are all the stands I use. I have some ground stands, as the big boom stands, and these boom stands come with the bag. Then some boom stands don't come with the bag. You buy them at this hardware store. I use concrete blocks to hold them up. So I have all kinds of stands, three foot stands, big stands. I have my silver white reflectors. The silver is great for putting in shadow and detail, or you could take off the silver thing and you could put a light, and this could serve as a nice white background. There's snoot if you want to make the light more narrow. And I recommend that you use the grid. This will make the light look more flattering. And it does come with gels, but I've never used the gels. And I recommend that you aim this at a 40 50 angle for a good contrast. Then we have reflector diffusers where you put this on the light and this aluminum will illuminate the light. These are tough, the high quality aluminum, they'll last for a lifetime. This is great for solar products or dramatic portraiture with continuous light. Sometimes, like I told you how to use concrete blocks, you could stand this up, you could put like a white foam board for a background. 
You can also hold things with the crates and buckets. And this is what wood I made that I found that someone was getting rid of. So I decided to get the wood. I decided to put angle brackets, L brackets from Home Depot. And I use this tables in my still life, like light painting. You could also use it, you could also put turn this into a table by putting like a white foam board in it, or just the white plexiglass sheet with the white paper still attached. That could be like a little, you know, still life table. I made this homemade rack from wood that I had. And I have holes that I could put, you know, the poles in. And this could be hold up a nice background. Now I'm using this. This is holding all my um, big white or black foam boards. These cubes, you could turn into a little miniature white flex table. You could put like, a white foam board, and you can also put like a clear piece of plexiglass sheet that could serve as a white plex table. You can do the same thing with the stool. It used to be a chair. The arm was coming apart, so I just had to saw it off. I didn't want to throw this away, and I still have this today. This could also be used as a tool for someone to sit on. You could put a light or a table on. This is like a floor rack where when I bought a dishwasher, I did not want to throw this away. And I screwed on a piece of wood and this is great for like holding a light on the grounds. We have big black hard bees. Um, this is made from stretcher art frames and I got plant, plastic canvas paper from Office Depot. And it's just stapled on. This is great for creating a big block for the the block of sunlight. And I've used this in other types of photography too. These are expansion poles. These are great for holding up scrims or reflectors. And these are CAG clamps to hold it in place. These are very flexible and easy to use. These are poles. I use these for, you know, the black flex table, the angle, the reflector. These are the lenses that I use. A lot of times I either use, depending on like if it's product, I like the EF35. This is a great lens for, you know, portraiture, also for solar product. But if I want to get a little wider, then I use the EF35. I recommend the prime lenses because they're sharper in focus. But if you want to zoom, you just move in. But they're cheaper in price. But I've used these a, a while. I also use my two non primes for outdoor photography, like the 7200. I like the F4 because it's a lighter than the 2.8. That 100 to 400, that's a lot heavier than the 7200. But this is also good to use outdoors too. But for continuous lighting, I pick one of these primes. So the R5, R6, they're both great cameras used. And I'm very thankful the R converter, RF converter, because I could use all my non RF lenses. And I'm very happy with the results. I recommend you do the R5, R6, or R3. They're all very good. And I have a YouTube video on the R5, R6, and I have a YouTube video on the R spot. And I talk about how I use it in my still life photography. And there's image stabilization. Other cameras like Nikon call this fiber reduction. I always have this turned off because a lot of times I use a tripod. So you want to take it off. I just want to have it off. But some people do use it. If you use a tripod and turn it off, but if you don't, turn it on. But I just have it turned off. And for the manual autofocus, 
And we're going to sell off IDCs, you ought to focus. But then for like light painting, if focus is hard, I try to use manual. And sometimes for other photography, I do an autofocus and then I just switch to manual. So the sensor does not think when I'm, you know, light painting in the dark. Here's my camera cases. I purchased at a computer store and they're sturdy and tough. They don't take a lot of space. Still use them today. And then I have tripods. I always use my stand in the studio. But for outdoors, I like to use my tripod. And one of them is an architect and this is like a landscape. So I decided to cut this off where if I want to get really down on the ground. A lot of times, if it's bright sunny, I want to use ISO 100. I want to keep it there. But if the bow tripod, maybe 800, 400. And I always want to use a cable release or a remote or still life or, you know, regular or even continuous lighting. And the reason why I recommend a cable is remote so you can avoid camera shake. There's my wired release where this will fit the R5. This also used to fit my R7, Canon D7. So I was very relieved and I was able to use, the used to use my R Canon 7D. This will also fit my, um, the R5. And this is for the R6. And it, you know, they both do the same thing. They hold camera still when you take the shot and use the shutter release. And this is the remote control where these are basically the same thing. The only thing that's different is the wire. This, you know, this used to fit my Canon 70. This also fits my R5. And it works with AAA batteries. And this will fit any major, you know, any hot shoe of any modern Canon camera. And this is great. If you want to walk like 15, like if you want to move away from the camera many feet away, you have 30 channels to work with. And it also has a good ball timer where it specifies the hour and two digits, minutes and seconds and two digits separate of colons. A lot more flexible. So then we have connecting cables to the computer where. This would be my phone, Canon 7D. This would be for, this will connect to the cam computer and this will connect to the camera. And I used to do, you know, Lightroom totally capture. And, some, and so sometimes I use my big computer screen as a light meter to determine and just really look at the photograph when I do other light photography like light painting. So this is the droid where if you want to see your photograph on the phone, you'd be looking at the JPEG. And the screens are similar for the R5, R6. Then you have equipment to clean the Plex table. You have the Novus. A lot of times I just use Novus for the white Plex table in the black. Sometimes you use two or three, but a lot of times I just use um, one. You know, two's for light scratches and three's for heavy scratches. Now, dust is not such an issue in the white as it is in black. But you might want to have a lens blower just to blow off any stray dust. These are my mirrors, my mirror plates, armature clamps, my duct tape, for holding things, my CAG clamps, my spring clamps, and my clothespins over here. Here's my gels. You, you really, you, you're probably better off buying this online because stores are not selling this as much as they used to. Then they have white, Silver reflectors, gold reflectors, you have film draft paper, 
Then you have, you know, cinephile. You have plastic fees and scrims. You have stretch art frames. You can buy also frames at a store like Target. You also buy the draft fusion paper at an art store. Then you have white flexible sheets, black, and you have clear. I've been using these big six foot scrims a lot. You just put the scrim, you just rest it on the stroke. You could rest it on the table. You don't use to use a stand and they're convenient to use. And it is wood from a hardware store like Home Depot and it's connected with L brackets in the corners and you just staple on the tracing or fusion paper and you have a nice scrim. You could also have a nice cool background. You have white cars of all sizes. It's good for doing food. It's also great for creating a background. Pretty much create a background depending on how to use the light, the background light. You have black cards are great for creating like a black background. It's also great for taking off glares in a solid product if you don't want them in a photograph. And it's great for playing a, like a brown background depending on you know where you have the light. Now it's time to do camera raw demo. Are there any questions any equipment so far? Show the now. Okay. Now. These files have all been processed because they have this. But if you ever want to start all over, you can just go over here, reset the default. You can also load you know, settings like in other types of photography. So I would just do this. I would just set the white bounds. And then I don't touch the curve. I don't touch the detail. I want to do that in the ends. Optics, this is automatically checked with the R6, R5. If it's not, it should be checked. It's good to remove the chromatic aberration. It's good to use you know, the profile corrections. Chromatic aberration is the color problems of the edges, and it'll take care of that problem you have this checked. And when you check off use profile correction, they'll use whatever lens you're using. I was using the 85 in this case. In geometry, I just want to click the A a lot of times to straighten any you know, crookedness or distortedness. And then this is vignetting. If there's dark, you want to adjust this so that the dark, so the corners are evenly lit. But you also put in, you know, if you move it this way. You could put like a slight vignetting effect. And then the same thing over here. And this photograph where, actually this is the finished product where I had a light here, then I had a light here, but decided to turn off uh, one of the row lights to bring out the shadow more because I want to make it uh, read more dimension. And I had to use black cards to take out some glares to make it look good. And then, let's see. I also produced all the JPEGs with this tool where you do image processor, where I have all the settings set so I don't have this checked. So you have a JPEG, quality 10, and convert, since I've been posting on the web, the sRGB. If I'm copying and pasting in Photoshop, I will not have this checked, and I click run. Then I'll create like a folder 
and it'll produce all the JPEGs. I can also save as a JPEG in Photoshop too, and I'll show you that later. Now we're gonna go into, let's see, Adobe Photoshop. This is the first photograph I did where Where when I first get this photograph, I can either save with an action or I could just save it here. And then I have an action that will, I will burn with Lumosity blend mode, and then I dodge with the screen. But at first, when I run this action, where it does all this, it produces this, and then, you know, I do control I, let's see, to invert it. And then I get like a soft brush, a very soft brush, and I paint in to improve it. And then I come over here, I could do auto, I could also do this if you want to set the white point and make it a little more wider. And then, so this is one action. This is another action. And you have another action for this, after this. Well, I'm going to throw all this away because I already did it. I was dragging things I don't want in the trash. And then when I do the sharpening, there's an action. I use dozen scratches to speckle, and then I have the high pass. So the dozen scratches, I have it at 1.3, and then the speckle. There's no prompt for that. And then the high pass. We got filter. I go to high pass and make a change. And then this high pass, I always want to use soft light for the filter to make it look good and natural. And then for the frame, where this action calls groups of other actions. So this action calls this action, and the action comes over here, and then it calls the black, because the color is black, and then it comes over here, if it is MF here, if document is landscape, go to big width, if not, go to height. So you have, let's see, you have big height, and then you have big width. Then, if I want to save as a JPEG, I do export, save for web. So it already has, see how the height is 4,000? It came for that frame of the macro. And convert the sRGB. And I'll tell you the size, 4.213. You know, and when you save it, 
you got to tell the computer where you want to save it. Let's see. I'm going to save it in here. The next time when you, I also have an action that does that too. So if I were to say this again, which I will, Save legacy. I'll save it again the same because when you use this action again, Photoshop's smart enough to remember where you saved it originally. But when you first use the action, you have to go navigate. But when you run it again, Photoshop will remember the location. The second photograph I did, and I didn't want to have reflections. I do want to have a shower to make it look natural. I think it's just a personal preference here where, you know, I run this action. So I, this is the first part where I just want to improve this. I want to burn a Lamasi blend mode, make sure they pass it 100. You want to dodge at a screen blend mode. That's the first part. The second part, where I click auto, and then I just set the white to make this a more solid white. And this is the, you know, I also have, when I run the action, I also have another signature that's white. But since we're doing white, I decided to keep this one and delete the white signature. And then the frame, where I do that same action, where I run this, I play this action, I come down over here, and then it comes over here. So it calls other actions when it's done, then it comes over here. It comes over here, depending on, so this is not a landscape, it's going to go to big height where the height along the side, the height will be, you know, 4,000 pixels. So when I, after I run this action, the image size, the height is 4,000 and it's 200 pixels per inch. And the sample is automatic. So this, when I run this action, they'll produce these these um, numbers here. Do the same thing where that's why to control the light, maybe I could use the black card. I decided just to turn off one of the rows of the light of the photo back to bring out the shadow more. And I want to make this look like dimensional lighting. Maybe I could a little bit better job masking here, but where is that one another action where I would, you know, burn with the velocity blend mode using a very, you know, soft brush. So I use a very soft brush. And then you want to screen dodge with the screen blend mode. So I would, you know, paint this good in this layer and come over here, paint this good. And then to get the black, I would have to invert it. It'd be like a white mask. I would have to do control I to invert this because white reveals black hides. And I want to reveal more of this product and I'm going to make it look natural with the shadow. I'm going to come over here, click on auto, and maybe I could have done this, but you know what? 
I don't like that. I think it's way too natural. So I'm going to do Control Z. I decided not to click the white pounds because it looks not as natural. Maybe I could have cloned off here, but overall, I like this dimensional lighting. It makes it look like a piece of art. And when I put a little shadow detail too. I'm going to use that same action to do the frame. And then I can either, you know, run that action for the JPEG. I'm going to save it with Photoshop from memories were previously saved. And again, if I run this action, I'm using convert the sRGB. Um, so this is the highest longer. So this would be 4,000 based on the photo file size. I'm going to say the little name, but it remembers. I'm going to run this action. Convert the sRGB because I post into the web. Here are my files. The height is bigger than the width. So the height is 4,000, and it's at should be at 200. The size. I click save. So, you know, I think I did in this. I also, I did this, before, you know, I decided to use, you know, the white balance to make the white photograph more white, to make it look like a natural white. So now we're going to go to the screenshot presentation. Let's see. So this is the screenshot presentation. And I just have screenshots if I, well, I want to explain something again or more clarification. Now, first, I want to start with Adobe Camera Raw. Now, the basic setting is, there are many ways to use a basic setting, but I always want to set the white balance. I want to set the white balance with a gray car to find a gray neutral. But sometimes, depending on the photograph, I want to zero out the highlights plus out the shadows. Or I want to go negative 30 highlights plus 30 shadows for an even balance. I could also increase or decrease the composure and contrast. I want to have the clarity between two and three. Sometimes I've been using two and three lately. Now, for black and white photography, I used to decrease the saturation, but I do everything in Photoshop. And for light painting, where I don't touch any of this, I just set the white balance. Some people, they have data, they make an S curve over here. Most of the times I don't touch this, but I could. Now for sharpening, some people like to use this, uh, like these 140 or 120, depending on what they're doing. They want to have the noise structure around 50. The color noise may be 30, but this is great. If you want to take out noise, color noise reduction, just make sure that you want to go to 300, black spots, you want to use this to take them out. But make sure you do fit and view when you're done. But I want to leave this section alone. You don't do everything in Photoshop. Now, the optics. You always want to have removed chromatic vibration, removes color problems. You always want to use your profile lens. In this case, I was using a 100 to 400, but I remember what. But it's probably, you know, a D or something. 
a lot of times it's still if you use the prime lens. Okay, this will be recorded, Melissa. Yeah. Now, the geometry I just want to use this. To straighten the verticals, rotate, I'd rather do that in Photoshop. But for the geometry here, I just want to click on the A. Now, the effects, I don't want to touch the grain, but if there's vignetting in a photograph, I want to put vignetting in a natural way, I want to use the vignetting slider down here. And yetting is great for you know straightening out uneven problems like one photo may be darker than another, or if you want to put in gradual vignetting, you could use it. So vignetting this slide could be really helpful. Vignetting. Now, if the image processor, um, if I want to post in Photoshop, I want to check this off. Convert profile to sRGB. If I want to copy and paste in Photoshop, but I don't because I'll have a color mismatch problem. So there's many ways you can use an image processor for producing, you know, a JPEG in you know two different ways. And you know, there are other ways you could use this. You could save it as Photoshop, but I don't. I just use it for the JPEGs, like for light pinning or just the process JPEGs really quick. Now it's Photoshop. Sometimes when I'm doing an HDR, I want to come over here. I want to run an action. Let's say auto align and auto blend. There are many ways you could use the auto blend. I think for stack sharpening, I use both for like outdoor work. And then this is great for like any background layer. If you want to put in some auto tone, auto contrast, auto color automatically. And when I run this, I'll do this levels auto, that was contrast, and levels all at once, one right after the other. And sometimes I have a set of actions where I duplicate the layer, they'll come down over here. So this is when this happens, this happens, and then this happens. I want to save it in Photoshop. Again, you got to tell Photoshop where you want to save it. So next time you run this action, I'll go to that location. Then we have the burn, dodge or burn, where we burn with the velocity blend mode, we dodge with the screen blend mode, where, you know, and then there's a levels adjustment. I click on the auto for the color corrected quicker. And then there's two actions, one for the black and one for the white. And depending on what looks better, I delete one. I just have one signature. And depending on like if it's a, if it's a white flex table, if I want to make it white, I want to click the white dropper here. If I want to make it more black, I want to click the black dropper here. And the other ways you could use set the white and black points in Adobe Camera Raw. But I'd rather just do this in Photoshop. And I got the soft three back on there. We have the dust and scratches, which is over here. Set the 1.3. Then there's no prompt for this. And high pass, I set it. And then it'll end in a you know, soft light blending mode. This is the frame where this happens. So it comes over here. It runs this, and then it goes to this action. I'll come over here, and then in this action comes over here, and then it does a condition depending on its landscape or height. It runs either of these actions. So after I run that action, this is what the file could look like. The width is bigger, so it's 4,000. Sometimes I have a 300, sometimes I have a 200, not too much of a difference. 
We have unsharp mass settings. If I were to do this alone, I'd have this up to 200. I want to leave the radius to 1.0 because I want to affect one pixel and not 1.5. I feel like that's better. A threshold would be good between six and seven levels for good contrast. And another set of actions for the background. I have the speckle, I have the dust and scratches, and the unsharp mask. And then if I, after I run this, it'll say fade unsharp mask, and then you can change to a certain blend mode. Yeah, with fade prompt, you know, luminosity blend mode. I like to leave it 100%. We have noise, we have the speckle. There's no prompt for this. Here we have um, dust and scratches, which is here. And you have unsight mask. And this time I didn't use the fade with the blend mode. But JPEGs, where if I were to save, you know, a quick JPEG, we have quality 100, convert the sRGB. And you want to ask where to export each time to make sure it goes in the right place. Very similar to the quick export, J, the quality be 100 and invert to sRGB. So it's sort of the same thing, save for the web. And then the edit paste in places and light painting. If I make a copy of a JPEG in another file with the same file, they'll paste in place. And then I want to, you know, paste in place. And I always want to end in a light and blend mode. The frequency separation, where the first is a high pass, this is good for cloning. For the cloning tools, the low frequency is good for the uh, like the um, the frequency Gaussian blur tools. The blend node is you know linear light, and the low frequency is a normal blend node. And the you know the filter high pass is here. In my black and white photography, we have many ways to be black and white. We could work with the channel mixture in many ways. We could zero, we could, you know, zero out the red, green, blue. We can check off the monochrome. We can do the vibrance. We could make the vibrance and saturation negative 100. We could have like black and white combos where you have many actions. You have a gradient map where you can set the red mode at color. It's a cool black and white. You have unsaturation where you can just negative out the hue, negative out the saturation. Lightness. You want to adjust the contrast, you can. Threshold. It's good if you put it in color, that's a good black and white. In my workflow illustration, we have our layers, we have my navigator screen, we have my brushes, and my tabs. This is my photography groups, meetup clubs. In my fun art store. Where you can buy, you know, I do a lot of still life. I also do a lot of nature. My portfolio. What I showed tonight. My YouTube channel where 
Still, I feel this game about Capucci Rally. We have my playlist where I'm starting to grow this channel. It's a new edition where I talk about landscape photography or camera settings at Photoshop. That's all on this channel. And then I talk about equipment and still like photography and light painting. And then I talk about light painting, like webinars. I have black flex table webinars. So, we have white flex webinars, Adobe software, black flex light painting, equipment, and also landscape. So, the new edition is landscape. So, I'm going to be posting a landscape photography information. So actually, this is my Facebook, Instagram. So my Instagram, I do black and white portraiture. I also do other, you know, you know, light painting too. And then I have, I showed you my others, my Twitter, LinkedIn. So if you have any, is, so does anyone have any questions? I don't think you do, but you can ask them now. And I will post a recording to this and I'll put an outline with the, with the, with the title and times of the sections. So the next question. So, you know, thank you for listening and, you know, maybe consider liking and subscribing. And my YouTube channel, which is here, a lot of information there. If you have any questions, you can only email me at mfutureliar2016 at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with me, Facebook, Instagram, website links. All right, so to no questions, let's see. Yeah, thank you for listening. So I am going to post this, so I'm going to end it. I'm going to